Well, good evening, everyone. It's a little bit after the appointed hour, and there's a lot of people in the, on the screen, so I think we'll get started. Welcome to the uh, Lyme and Allen Art Museum, or at least the virtual, virtual version of it. Um, my name is Sam Quigley, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to our virtual opening uh, of tonight's uh, exhibition opening, Forest Dreaming, Paintings and Sculptures by Anna Flores. I wish we could all be gathering under one roof tonight. And frankly, uh, due to the sudden change in our pandemic precautions, it looks like we could have. Uh, this kind of took us by surprise. Clearly, we could be doing it together. But when we scheduled tonight's event, um, there was nothing clear about anything back then. Uh, so here we are. But we'll make the best of it. I think that um, this will be perhaps a nice entree to the show and it will be open for quite a while. So uh, hopefully everyone will have a chance to come and take a look at it in person. Um, I'm very happy that Anna is here tonight. She's in the very center of my screen. I hope she's in the center of yours too. She should be. Um, Anna Flores is here. We look forward to having a great conversation with her tonight. Um, so we can all get to know a little bit more about her, this particular body of her work. Uh, there are not, several other people I want to thank, but first, of course, is, you know, thank you um, for your show and for your being here in the first place. Um, I also want to make a, a, a special call out to the amazing team that prepped and installed the show, uh, led by our registrar and director of exhibitions, Jane Legro. Jane is expertly assisted by our curator, Tanya Port, and our collections associate, Sydney Ote Ntiri. Um, I also want to express a special gratitude to the Community Fund of Eastern Connecticut for their special support of this exhibition, as well as a number of the programs that go with it. Uh, more about them in a moment from Sophia Gibstein Shiroko. For their generous support of our entire exhibition program, I also want to express uh, my gratitude to the Frank Loomis Palmer Foundation, the State of Connecticut's Department for, of Economic and Community Development, and an anonymous foundation in New York City. Um, backing us up here at the museum and making all the things tick and go together is an incredibly active and capable group of dedicated individuals collectively known as our Board of Trustees. And we're very, very grateful to all of them. And another important uh, group of uh, important volunteers to us is our group of uh, expert docents, who I'm happy to say will be shortly brought back into the fold now that we are going to be open for tours and we'll be able to have uh, group tours uh, brought to you by these able group of people. Um, we're going to get going in a moment, but I'm going to ask Sophie uh, to give us, Sophie Gibstein Shiroka, to give us a little information about the uh, events that are associated with this exhibition before we get going. Yes, so we do have an exciting series coming up this summer and into the fall. Um, we have the Forest Dialogue series, which will be taking place on the third Sunday of July, August, and September. So that will be July 18th, August 15th, and September 19th from 2 to 3 p.m. in the afternoon um, down in the garden right by um, on a sculptures. Um, so you will have time to attend the event and also have time to come inside the museum and see the pieces inside the gallery. Um, there are three different topics. So the first one is nature as master artist, then the art of land conservation, and waking up to the earth. So more information will be up on our website this coming week. Um, the seats will be limited, unfortunately, just to the nature of the area, but you can begin registering now. You can email either the front desk um, or you can email myself, um, Gipstein. You should see my name on the screen at LimeAndAllen.org, or you can always go to our website. Um, but a easy register link should be coming soon. So back to you, Sam. All right. 
Well, I'm just going to give a brief idea of what's going to be happening tonight, as has been the case for the last several of our virtual openings. We'll present a little walkthrough by video and uh, still images of the exhibition. And that'll be followed up by some conversation with Anna. And then we'll open it up to questions and discussions from everyone else. So if that sounds good to everybody else, give me a moment and I'm gonna start off with the uh, presentation, all right? Let's see here. I hope everybody can see this screen and we'll sit back and let it happen. This will probably take about 10 minutes, folks.
Anna, I don't want to destroy the serenity of your work, but it does seem to me that if you would want to speak up about anything, please feel free to do so. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I, I do want to thank everyone who's helped make this exhibition possible. It's been an extraordinary team of very eager and just always willing helpers and uh, especially Jane who has gone to bat for almost two years answering every concern and worry and writing grants, et cetera, plus helping move those bronze sculptures into place, which um, gave all of us backaches. Um, so I hope that's not what pushed her over and, and um, made her unwell the last few days. But um, so it's been great working with her. Uh, I wanted to be able to talk tonight from my studio so you could see the forest, which has been such a important muse to me for this work. Uh, we've been living in Southern Rhode Island in um, Charlestown for 40 years now. Um, and we bought an unfinished house next to the forest. And the forest really changed me. Um, I'd never lived so close to the natural world. It, um, it was a real transformation, learning to be in a, in a community that wasn't just human. You know, our, our closest neighbors are maybe um, a quarter mile each way. So, so our neighbors really are the non-human uh, of the non-human kind. And it's, it was a fascinating education for me to really understand what was going on in this ecology. And um, nothing in art school prepared me for what would happen to me here because um, place sort of entered through me and I was no longer going into the studio sort of making a series of drawings or, or paintings that would lead to a more serious engagement. After a time living here, it was like the images and what I needed to make came through my feet and up through me. I had no choice in a way. Um, and walking was a huge part of the studio process. It was no longer being in the studio to start what I was doing. Um, what I needed to do was walk and breathe and take everything in through the many senses and allow it to kind of register. And then finally, they sort of came to me almost in a dreamlike fashion. So it's a very, it's been a fascinating process. But in that time, I also realized I'm very blessed to have this forest and not everyone has a forest. So what do I do with this? And so that's what really be, made me a, an ecological sort of activist artist where I was really committed to going out to communities and helping them engage with the landscapes they live in. And um, that public work is not really part of the indoor studio exhibit, but um, when we do the summer dialogues using the forest chairs, it'll give me a chance to bring in that community that has been so important in the way that I work. Um, so, um, so that's a little something, but as you can see with all of these pieces, many of them start with a found piece of wood or branch or stone that then sort of suggests a story to me. Um, some of the pieces now are cast in aluminum or bronze. And that has been a whole process of change in the last five years. What began to happen is when I would sell a piece made out of those branches, it was always a very delicate uh, process to bring these to shows and install them. But then if a buyer or a patron wanted a piece, you know, if they were local, I could deliver. But what really sort of set me on the path to commit to more um, cast work was when I sold some uh, branched pieces in Boston and the patron said, I want these shipped to my house in Mexico. <laughs> and so it was, um, I thought, you know, first I sweated bullets thinking, oh my God, how am I going to make this happen? And, um, you know, finally about a, three weeks later into making a specially designed crate and figuring out how the shipping would go, et cetera, 
I said, okay, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. I've got to find a, a foundry to work with close by so I can really um, translate these. And I do want to say that there is an extraordinary uh, foundry in the area run by a woman called uh, the Mystic River Foundry. Um, and it's been a great um, new connection for me and it's allowed me to go into permanent materials. Um, you know, in, 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 more commonly, I, I would do periodic castings, but it, I had to get a you know special commission to to make it happen, etc. So that's been a big change in the work, and I'm I'm very happy about it. I've had to learn how to deal with patinas on metals, which is a whole other process of coloration. It's not at all like painting or painting on wood, etc. Um, so I'm probably talking too much. So maybe I'll let some questions come in. Well, indeed, it's hard to imagine you would be talking too much, but I'm sure a lot of people will have some questions. I, I myself was enchanted, am enchanted by your show, the calmness of it all. Um, I wish, even though I live in a relatively rural area, I wish I lived further out like you do uh, with, as you say, only four, four legged creatures as your immediate neighbors. It's quite wonderful. Um, it, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your daily uh, work in the studio? I mean, do you first walk the area and then come back to the studio, or is that something that happens over? The yeah, I mean, walking's a huge walk. I walking allows me to think and and plan, and it's it's part of everything. And um, many of these pieces, I'm slow when I work. I mean, I will you know, I'll walk and I will draw and mock up things with found elements that I find. But I'm, I sort of let everything gestate for a long time because in many ways it's a dialogue with the materials. It's what they're trying to tell me. I mean, there's a real, I don't force images. They kind of sort of define themselves to me. So um, for example, that piece with the, the branches coming out of the figure that took a year or two. Yeah. Um, the the bronze chairs, um, which which were called the forest dialogue chairs, that took a process of four years between where I realized the project, I began to do drawings that kind of um, reduced the design down to what I wanted and what I could do, and then translating it, first making it full scale in wood and then bringing it to the foundry. The foundry has to cut up the pieces of wood, you know, in wood that I bring them. And then they do sand mold castings. And then I bring the pieces home almost like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. And that has to be re-welded. And then I sometimes jiggle things around at that stage and then patina. So I'm slow, you know, so I can't say, you know, I'm cranking stuff out a lot in the studio because it just, I have, three or four pieces going and then I just let them simmer and come up together. Um, often I've got other community engagement work going on that I'm not in the studio and I'm working out in community. Um, you know, the last year and a half that's been really, as we all know, uh, taken away and I've really felt a huge, you know, lack of that. So allowing the summer programs to happen at the museum using the chairs and having public dialogues is really ex exciting for me because I, I just really, I need a multiple kind of uh, medium to keep me happy as an artist. I can't just be making objects. You know, I really feel the objects are almost meditative um, sculptural pieces that then give me the public thinking that I need to do and and then I, I translate some of what I've learned in those series to the public uh, when I do community projects. Tell me, uh, before we move into the community projects, I, I still am fascinated by the, the sanctity uh, or the solitude of the forest and um, almost the mystery of it. I mean, I'm, I'm a city boy, so you know it really is uh, very intriguing to me. And I, I particularly am interested in your interest in shadows. I know that when we installed this exhibition, you were very uh, keen to have the shadows 
be cast upon the walls in different, very specific ways. And I wonder whether that's, that's something that you came to think about a lot while walking in the forest. Well, certainly you see your shadow cast in the forest if the sun is shining on you. So you have that sort of um, happening. But with sculpture, um, I've always been fascinated by, I can make a small piece of sculpture, but by how I light it, a whole other reality comes into being because that shadow is a whole other medium and a, a whole other mystery. Um, I really began to play with shadow when I was working on um, a long series I did based on Cuba. And, and the shadow became very important to me because I've made small wooden figures often that these figures moved or were, they were almost toy-like, but then I would put a lot of um, dramatic light on them so that they were larger and had these dramatic shadows because the, the thinking there was, I've come from this island that is really, you know, it's, it's, it's a large island, but it's not, you know, it's not a continent or whatever. And this small island, because of its um, political history and because of its um, cultural history, has cast such a large shadow in the world, you know, it has such a presence. So that's when I really began to play with what can I make that looks small, but then if you light it and if you see it in a certain light, it takes on a huge other presence. So the importance of shadow sort of started becoming a part of my work at that point. Um, and with, with the tree imagery, of course, once you bring something into a, in a gallery and just you have a branch, if you light it right, it becomes like a whole forest. Um, and I wanted that drama. Well, if I may say so, uh, as, I, as everybody knows, I have a very high regard for Jane Legro, and I do wish she could be here tonight to talk with you tonight, but she did an expert job in, in lighting, it, well, first displaying and then lighting the show. So when one comes in, you'll see that you'll get the benefit of her work uh, through those shadows. Yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't not, I was there sort of initially when we were hanging, but yeah, the magic happens with the lighting and I can see just from the video, she, she did a great job. Yeah. Well, and I recall visiting your, your studio, which is a magical in its own self, uh, but um, there is something about seeing your, the very same works that we saw in your studio in this different environment where it's a gray wall, sort of a, a, a new uh, beckoning, you know, of, of a new era. I mean, it's just so different and it's so pure, it's, it's quite beautiful. And I think Jane did a terrific job of installation along with you. Let's get back to the idea of community. I mean, um, obviously, there will be some people that you commune with in the forest, but you know, you're looking to bring that to the fore here. Uh, um, I know that you know some of the uh, discussions will have uh, sort of a poetic style to them. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your role as a poet as well and, and some of the people you work with? Well, I don't, I don't consider myself a poet. Um, I, I mean, the poetic understanding of the world is certainly important to me, but I'm not a poet. I mean, um, but poetry is a huge component in sort of understanding the world and reducing it down to, you know, really important pure metaphor. Um, and so I've worked one of the, let me just um, tell you about the earliest sort of ecology community project that I began um, after we had moved here. Uh, I also want to say not only was the forest a muse for me, but people we began to meet here who also lived in very, you know, extraordinary places, each, you know, in the area, but each quite different, you know, there were two couples in particular who lived by the Wood River, and they began um, the Wood River Watershed Association. So not only they, did they become good friends, but I saw in them just an extraordinary example of how to be 
stewards of the places you love. You know, they created this river organization that has made that river a much cleaner river and it's now one of the wild rivers of America. It wasn't at all that when they first started committing to that. So that kind of mentorship and model in, in, in these dear friends, um, this was um, Betty and Mitch Solomon and Ed and Linda Wood who were extremely important in that way, really also shifted my thinking, you know, because, um, you know, none of this was just about being an artist. It was just about how do you how do you use whatever gifts you have or you care about to do you know to to give back and and to um, you know um, share you know allow other people to understand where they are because I realized just how fortunate I was to have this land around me. So uh, what happened was I was invited to do a, a artist residency there at the watershed. This was the first time they'd had an artist in residence. And, um, you know, I had never done an artist residency with an environmental group. I certainly worked in schools a lot, so I knew about sharing my artistic process that way. But this was a new kind of chapter in my life. How do I work with an environmental group? What does that mean? They also had a wonderful director, Lori Urso, who was a, herself a musician and a creator. So she didn't give me any boundaries. You know, she just figured, I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so for the first week I tried to go and walk the watershed because this was also my watershed. So it had a particular meaning to me. Um, and I didn't wanna go there with any sort of preconceived ideas as to what I would do. But by walking, as I mentioned, walking is a huge part of how I work and think. I began to understand the landscape and the landscape, you know, I, I began to see certain things about it that spoke to me. <laughs> And one of the things that kept speaking to me was the garbage that people were leaving on the trails, you know. So by the second day, I brought a garbage bag and I was, you know, spending most of my time looking down, picking up garbage and thinking, this is what I was thinking. I said, how do you turn slobs into poets? How do you make people more thoughtful out here? So that, that phrase slobs into poets just kept haunting me. And so after four or five days, I thought, how do I do that? And, and, and then on the fourth day, I began to notice birdhouses that people put up or DEM puts up. And I thought, you know, that's a good human gesture. You know, we're not all bad, you know, we try. And, um, and I thought, why not turn that birdhouse into something where I can post a poem? And then you put a you know, journal in it, make it very simple and then have not just me make these things, but community wide, get students, get stewards, get citizens. So it's not my project, it's the community project. So that was the first time it happened. We put up 13 boxes and had an extraordinary response over three months. The journals got filled three times, four times, they had to be replaced. And it was the simplest of sort of concepts, you know, um, and I realized people want to come out here and walk and want to come out here and maybe think more poetically that maybe there wasn't a model for them. And just putting up this simple poetry box with a beautiful poem inside and allowing them to think poetically kind of gave them this whole new opportunity. And so that project has kept traveling um, all over the country and it went to England. And now at the end, of our exhibit at Lyman Allen, I also want to say this is another part of this project that I'm doing there. We are going to do three poetry boxes on the grounds that will stay there permanently by three really extraordinary poets who are from New London and have a beautiful sense of place from about New London. And they are Rhonda Ward, Jose Gonzalez, and Michael Bradford. And I've worked with them before when I did a project in New London. I just love their poetry. I love them as people. So I'm just really honored that Lyman Allen has agreed to do this and that we will plant poetry boxes there. Um, but that's sort of the way, you know, you asked me how I work in community and that's a project that's been very long running that I've, and I've worked in other ways, but I think there's, I'll step back and allow questions, et cetera. Well, 
That's wonderful. Uh, and actually, one of the questions that's been posed on the chat is from Rhonda Ward. And uh, she asked whether or not you could, uh, uh, she said, your, your work is so very peaceful. And um, she, she said, the, the peacefulness, the relationship with nature is a gradual one, or is it very sudden? And I, I wonder whether or not you could say, is it something, it sounds like it might be a bit more gradual than a sudden epiphany. Uh, is that right? Well, I, I've, I've always been, um, when I was a child, I lived in Cuba and um, we had a little patch of jungle in our very urbane sort of neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I was a tomboy. I grew up with three older brothers there. And I was always, you know, going out looking at how lizards moved around or building forts out of palm fronds and making pigments out of tropical flowers. Um, so that part of me, I think, just came out very early where I was very connected to the natural world. And, um, and then when we came to America, we moved around a lot because, you know, we were immigrants, had no money and, you know, it, um, we landed in all kinds of places, but eventually um, my father who was an architect in Havana did build us a wonderful, our, our own home, which was called Buena Vista, which was such an approach, appropriate name on the highest hill in West Hartford, which does have a grand view. And that place had a backyard that was full of trees and birds. And then not far behind was a reservoir public reservoir where I spend a lot of very happy time. So that's always been a part of me, but I had never lived so close to it, you know, and when we moved here in Rhode Island to Rhode Island, it, um, it was a whole other deepening process into what it really means to be in an ecology that you're not just bicycling through or running through, you're actually living with it, trying to um, nurture it, um, and, and my husband's a great forester and he understands land. So, um, you know, I, I was able to learn through him more about the forest and, and you know, so it's been a, it's been a education process and, and the forest has worked on us as well. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's peaceful, but you know, there's a lot of, um, in this area, this, uh, there's stories here that go beyond the natural history here that are profound um, for me and have also been a part of my uh, practice as an artist. Two stories that are very important is one, this is the Narragansett lands. You know, the Narragansett people are still very present here, extraordinarily resilient considering the 400 plus years of oppression, you know, from the, the, um, the white, Europeans who came. Um, so I think this forest is sacred in many ways because it holds their stories. They're still here. They're one of the few tribes in the Northeast who were actually in the 70s allowed to get, get some of their land back. Um, so that has been a really extraordinary sort of um, lesson and, and opportunity for me to get to work with the, the tribal leaders. Um, some of them are neighbors um, and respect that history, but also, you know, there's a really dark story there because of what happened here. And I get that darkness. Um, there's also another layer, which is um, Rhode Island had a very strong um, um, involvement with the slave history. Uh, Rhode Islanders uh, were 60% of the ships that went to Africa. And of course they did the triangle trade, which took them from the coast of Rhode Island to Africa to, to trade and pick up slaves. And then they went to the Caribbean. Many times it was Cuba. And then they did the third leg back to Rhode Island. So in many ways, when I moved to this forest, I thought, you know, I'm about as far from Havana, Cuba as I could be. But it turns out there's this whole layer of connection to Cuba because of the slave history. And in this area, uh, because of the open spaces near the marsh uh, salt ponds, 
is where the largest plantations were of the Rhode Island um, you know, plantation owners and the people working those lands were slaves from the Caribbean. So, so those layers are also here, which have, have been extremely important, but also something that I've, um, you know, had a lot of respect for and I'm still working with um, on a number of platforms. Um, Do you know, if I could, there's been a question posed uh, by Dorothy Milhoffer about whether or not you could specifically talk about uh, some of the pieces, and she mentioned specifically this Rothko-esque uh, picture, the heart of, of, of the forest. I think this is the heart. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've, I've always, there's another piece as you were coming in to the gallery. I don't know if you want to show that briefly, you know, across from the, uh, the Gaia piece in the hallway. Can you show that? It might be difficult for me to find it. Okay. If it's not okay. In the yeah, um, walking in the forest for me, since we got here, I've always seen sort of the, the roots of the trees underneath me and then the roots above me. I've always felt they're almost like veins and, and that once you walk it so many times, you feel like you are in the heart of the forest. You have become part of it and, and it's, this huge um, organism that, that you're walking through. And certainly that's been proven to be the case. There's been extraordinary um, ecological um, research done by a wonderful professor, an ecologist, Dr. Suzanne Simard, who is, and I'm sure many of you have been hearing about this by now, how the forest is interconnected by all the um, rhizomes, all the roots are connected together. So it is one huge network. It's either a brain or a heart underneath us. So it is, you know, it's functioning as a whole. It's not individual trees that are here, but it's a collection, a community working together and supporting each other. So this heart of the forest piece is sort of my metaphorical kind of a take on that symbiosis, symbiosis that you see in, in the forest. Thank you for that. Um, Gail Schwinkermeyer has suggested that you might be able to talk a little bit about the piece that you did for the September 11th garden at the museum as well, although I don't think we have a picture of that. Uh -huh. Perhaps you could tell us about it. Yes. Um, well, that was um, quite special working with that group because, as you know, there were 11 um, uh, people who lost, lost their lives from the southeastern Connecticut area. And it was a you know, huge responsibility to how do you honor that? Um, and the group wanted very much to create this garden in that beautiful space. So, again, I kept thinking, you know, what, how do we how do we honor that? And I, since it was a garden, I created this um, sculptural sort of pergola that, that had almost like a spider web um, design on top. And there's glass balls in that upper section that are meant to be almost like the dew drops that you would find on spider webs when, when it's um, in the morning or, um, so each of those glass balls represented one of the souls lost. Mm. And you see those glass balls again in the, some of the uh, pieces in the show. I've been using blown glass, not done by me. I've, I've had other glass blowers um, to work with me. Um, so it's been interesting bringing those back. Great. And the, that piece is obviously a permanent installation here, yes. just south of the uh, Deshaun Allen house and everyone's welcome to come yeah. and see. And, and there is one special element that you have to look for in that piece. One of the, the people that was lost was a four-year-old um, mm. little girl, a granddaughter who was flying with her mother uh, out to California. And um, the family had a, a sort of a mythic story they told every time they found a loose thread, the grandmother would say, oh, the thread fairy has been here. Mm. And um, the grandmother was part of this group who was helping, who had created the, you know, the, the group to, to create this memorial. 
So I, I felt, you know, that was a really beautiful story to weave in. So apparently after the day after they died, she did find a loose gold thread in the last bedroom they'd been in together at, in Connecticut. So I created this thread fairy image that is on one of the columns to honor that story, that family story that was so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, Ellen Anderson has wondered out loud here whether or not you could speak about the shaman ladders that you've created. Uh, they're so We have several of them, they're so beautiful. Yeah, those are the latest series. And again, they took a while because I had to, I was first working them out in wood and and then casting, et cetera. But those are my response to what I'm also noticing in the forest. Um, about four years ago, I started thinking about just, you know, because of the ecological problems we have and, and the forest, um, you know, reduction that's happening all over the world in a very uh, tragic way. I felt an anxiety in the forest and I kept thinking, you know, I, I imagine these trees want to leave and move just to, like many people want to get away from wildfires or whatever. So initially I made a piece about uh, trees trying to move on wheels, sort of moving trees as if they themselves could get themselves out of harm's way. And it, that was kind of problematic to play out as a full sculpture. So then I, I was thinking about trees climbing up into the sky um, and, and having a ladder at the exit. And, and then the shaman connection was very obvious because of course shamans are able to leave this world and go into the heavens and see things, et cetera. So they became shaman ladders. Um, so that's sort of some of the history behind that. Does that connect into the Pueblo world where they have the ladders that come out through the hole over the, the uh, uh, chambers? Yeah, you know, I there's, I, I'm not sure if there have you. I, I did research to see if there really are shaman ladders, and I'm not sure they are. There are. I think that's just kind of an invention that I've made. Wonderful. I mean, I'm I'm glad to be, you know, um, told differently. But I did. I was wondering, you know, is this something I've totally made up, or is there something that exists? And I haven't found anything yet. I don't know, but it's a wonderful image. Thank you mm -hmm. for creating it, if you did. Perhaps there's other people who'd like to vocalize some of their questions or engage you in conversation as well. Please feel free, folks. All you have to do is uh, unmute yourselves and speak up. There was another question from the chat from a Darlene who asked if you could talk a bit about how your work has evolved. I'm not sure if there's a specific time period, but you can kind of pick your own time period, I guess. Well, um, I think, as I said, I think coming, moving here and then after, uh, you know, a certain amount of time, it, it, there was a huge shift and it, it became work that not only, um, you know, I felt that I wasn't really in creating the images, they sort of were coming to me, but also the community engagement and public art aspect was very important. It, I couldn't work without that component. Um, so that's been a huge evolution and it's continual. I mean, this last two year and a half with the pandemic, um, it's been very solitary and I felt like part of me was missing, um, not having that component. Um, but it's, I, I, I think I, I sort of answered some of that. If, if, if you wanna be more specific, I can, I can address that. I have a question. Since we're in your studio, could you show us something that you're currently working on and what's inspired you for your current projects? Yeah, right now I'm not in the studio because I, oh. I couldn't get my internet to work. 
Oh, uh, bummer. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> and actually, right now, the the studio um, is, you know, it's. I felt. I feel like I've moved out a, a you know, a, a gaggle of children, and it's quiet for a little bit. <laughs> no. So. Um, uh, upstairs, there's paper mache chickens happening, which is a whole other thing. But, oh, that's uh, interesting. Do you have chickens? We've had chickens. We've had chickens. But okay. It's a whole other thing. I don't think I'm going to go there right now. Okay. Uh, but the downstairs sculpture studio is very quiet. Um, and that's okay. Right now, it needs to be. Nice. Um, Anna, could you speak about the yellow ceramic piece with the red finger? That you mean with the, the branches coming out? Yes. And and isn't isn't there a red finger, a hand? It does have a red finger, yes. It's called enlightenment. And that's kind of, that's a Buddha piece. You know how the Buddha became enlightened under the tree? Well, I thought he became a tree. So uh -huh. it's sort of uh, my take on that. Um, and it's actually made out of wood. Everything I, I do here comes from the wood of the forest, unless, I, as, I, as I said, I've started casting, but the, the originals are in wood. So um, we have, you know, a lot of trees that are pine that come down, and we have a, a local uh, neighbor just a few doors down who has his own portable sawmill. So I'll ask him to mill me, you know, the pine and in two inch thickness, three inch thickness, whatever. And then it gets, um, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I, um, I don't carve, I build up um, and, and then I grind at it and then take away. So, so that piece, that piece took a, about two years to figure out how to make. Um, and it's wood. And it's wood, huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's layered wood. You, when you see it in the studio, in the, in the gallery, you'll see it's, it's kind of layered. Well, I'm looking forward to coming to the gallery and seeing it for real. Good, come, yes. So, Anna, I have a question. Um, oh, am I muted? No, no. I'm, I'm good. Um, so I have a question about, um, so you have all these beautiful sculptures and you have beautiful 2D works. What, did one come before the other? Do, does, do you wake up on a certain day and say, today I'm going, to, I'm going to work in one medium or the other? How does that work? Well, um, that's a good question. I did start as a painter, you know, and I did art school, went to RISD, and I was first an illustrator, then a painter. And so painting is a huge part of me in color and, and 2D work. And, um, and the sculptural component came when we moved here, and, and I got very good with power tools because we had to finish the house, et cetera. So uh, a lot of times when I work on these series, I'll have, as I said, you know, ideas as I'm walking and then I'll sketch them out and then mock them up maybe just in, you know, 3D. And then as I work out the problems in them, sculptural problems, painting and drawing them is a whole other way to understand what I'm getting at. So they become in their own work, you know, the 2D work. And then I continue with the 3D. So it's it's very much complementary, and it's a way of working out the process um, and the ideas in them. For example, the the bronze chairs that forest dialogue series began first with getting people were very. I, I put out an appeal on Facebook looking for just old cane back chairs. So first I mocked it up with just old chairs and then started adding branches to them. And then I had to figure out, you know, how they were really gonna work. So then I did a series of drawings and larger paintings and then went back to, to the, uh, the chair problem in 3D and then eventually bronze. Well, we are, we are so, um, we're so looking forward to having families come to the museum this summer. We're free to everyone. And we want so much for the children to come into our, our landscape and 
feel what I think you feel. And so to, to get those families to a place where they're working with their children to look up and, and think about all of this, um, we're, really, we're really, really excited about that conversion of the environment and, and the art. Wonderful. I think it's terrific that you're open to the public for free. I mean, that's huge. I saw what happened there last summer with your wonderful show of um, the acrylic uh, sculptures and just delightful to see all those people coming in and you gave them so much joy. Yeah, it's great. Well, it gives us great joy when we are able to share such great work with a larger audience after all. So uh, we feel somehow like obliged or we just want to share it in general uh, to people. You know, there's another question here that's from Lisa and Jim, and they're wondering whether or not there's some Catholic imagery in the work as well. And they wonder whether or not that could be true. Well, spirituality is, I mean, certainly important to me. I'm thinking, I'm trying to think if there's Catholic imagery in any of these pieces there. Um, it could either be a capital C Catholic or a lower C Catholic. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I think they're more pagan and mythic than Catholic. Mm -hmm. I, I have, I have, I, I'm, I'm, I, I am, a, you know, I was born Catholic. Um, I'm not practicing right now, but I feel very, uh, um, obliged to the Catholic Church for hiring the best artists they always could. <laughs> uh, and um, they certainly, in a way, I think the Catholic Church was one of the first and best ad agencies because they knew the image was the most important way to reach a public, especially a public that didn't read. So I've always felt that whatever is left of my Catholicism is my brotherhood to all those great artists that were hired by the Catholic Church uh, and, and the symbols and images they gave us. Um, and, but a lot of them were taken from the pagan traditions, as you know. Um, so. The tree plays fairly large in, in Catholicism, right? Yeah, but that's very large in pagan um, religions, huge, yeah early ancient cults, you know, I mean, the tree has been central to those. As I said, the Catholics borrowed and, you know, expanded. They were terrific about knowing what kind of imageries to use. I love that you say that, Anna, because this morning I mentioned to Sam that I got such a Nordic feel from your work. Um, and it reminds me of like Nordic gods and goddesses, which I, I felt was very interesting so it, i'm happy to hear that you feel that as well when you're in nature great yes thank you for bringing up the question of being for free uh, we will be free starting tomorrow all the way through labor day and like last summer it's an effort to, you know, make it easier for people to come in and see the works we want to share with them. But uh, we also really feel that it's important that, you know, in this moment when, you know, we're finally and suddenly allowed to get outside of our sequestered homes and safety uh, spots that, you know, we would love to have people come and enjoy um, air conditioned and very well ventilated uh, galleries where you know you can commune with your friends and your family um, in ways that perhaps were unthinkable only a couple months ago but uh, certainly we're here and available and free to all uh, right through the, to uh, Labor Day. Maybe as an um, effort to sort of bring this fascinating hour to a close, um, I can ask uh, Sophia Gipti and Shiroko to again give us a, a, information about the uh, events that are going to be a, associated with this exhibition, uh, both inside and, and uh, out, uh, out of doors. Sophie? We're doing a forest dialogue series um, with 
the two chair sculptures that we have installed in our garden. So on July 18th, um, it's a Sunday from 2 to 3 p.m. Um, it will be a topic of nature as master artist. Um, and then August 15th from 2 to 3 p.m., the topic will be the art of land conservation. And then Sunday, September 19th will be the final um, talk of the series again from 2 3, to 3 p.m. Um, and the topic will be waking up to the earth. So there'll be plenty of time either before or after the talk to go into the gallery and view the pieces in there and of course see the rest of the museum as well and wander the ground. Um, so reservations will be required. It is a free program, um, but we will have a limited seating option. So you can register um, Whenever you're ready, the information should be up on the website next week. Um, so you can always check there for more information as well. I, maybe, thank you, Sophie. Um, I, I just want to add just a little bit more about those events since I was, um, I know the people, et cetera. Um, the first one on July 18th, is that correct, Sophia? Um, is with um, Jennifer McGregor, who, um, is a wonderful curator who's worked with environmental art and public art for many years in the New York area. I just last year uh, worked with her because um, those bronze uh, chairs, the Forest Dialogue, um, was at Wave Hill, um, which is where she was with the curator. She's now um, retired from there, is now a consultant and working on her own. But because she's had a long history working with artists similar to myself, we will be talking about, you know, art and ecology and what that means for artists, what that's meant for me and how she as a curator has dealt with that. So I think that'll be a very interesting discussion. Um, and then the, um, the one in August, um, the art of conservation is two special people from Old Lyme who are both extraordinary uh, stewards there and have done a lot for conserving land in the area. And that's Patricia Shippey and um, Peter, uh, I'm just blanking. Uh, Cable, sorry. Um, and both of them in their own ways have been very instrumental in setting aside a lot of uh, land in Old Lyme. And Old Lyme is a really special situation because, as you know, Old Lyme was sort of put back on the map by the Amer American Impressionist School, um, who, who sort of found an anchor and a home at the uh, Florence Griswold, um, not the museum, but at, at one time it was just a boarding house. And so that whole idea of how the artist's gaze makes a place special and made people realize that beauty in itself is valuable. It shouldn't, maybe the land shouldn't be sold just for land. Maybe we should preserve it because there's something more here. And, and so what price is beauty? You know, so I think that a lot of the, the conservation efforts in Lyme have as part of the background is this aesthetic understanding of land, which was brought there by the artists who settled there in the, early part of the 20th century. So that's a very interesting dialogue. And I was able to work in Old Lyme two years ago as an ecological fellow. So that is how I became very interested in the people and what's, what's happened there. And then the last uh, program in September is actually a beautiful anthology of poets, Connecticut poets, um, which has been edited by the present um, poet laureate, Margaret Gibson of Connecticut. And these are all poets responding to the ecological issues going on in their world today. So there'll be selected poets reading from that and, and, and having a dialogue. And the book is called Waking Up the Earth. Mm. Uh, so, so all of them really revolve around all those issues that I've been talking about tonight. Well, and as long as you've mentioned the Old Lyme Art Colony, too, um, I might add that another show that will be on view here that's very complimentary, although in a different way, 
will be of the work, it's called the Prismatic Palette, and that opens next Friday, next Saturday. Um, and that will be work by Frank Vincent Dumond and his students. Um, and they will be depictions, mostly canvases uh, of very beautiful landscapes, plenty of trees to be sure, and plenty of color. So I think the, the two shows will work very well together. So come one, come all. Look forward to seeing that. Anna, we're so grateful for you to have shared your work with us here at the museum and with all of the people here online tonight. Thank you, thank you. And we'll look forward to seeing everyone here, um, here in the gallery pretty soon. And I hope everybody has a wonderful evening and a weekend too. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I'm honored to, to be there with you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming too. <laughs>